If you've been paying attention, you'll know that Intel's launch of their new 11th gen processors and the motherboards meant to house them has been and continues to be one hell of a strange ride. First off, the Z590 motherboards are already on sale and in the wild and have been for at least the last couple of months now. And secondly, some of the new 11th gen chips are already being sold in some regions while the rest of us have to wait until later this month for them. Unless you're gamers nexus and have the money, contacts and eagerness to crap all over Intel, in which case you can buy them in those regions and just ship them over to you. But regardless of how stupid the whole situation is, Intel's 11th gen chips are on the horizon and you're gonna need a board to go along with them. So, in today's video I'll be taking a quick first impressions look at what'll probably be one of the most popular options out there, namely Asus's ROG Strix Z590E Gaming Wi-Fi. And as a bonus, I'll even toss in some preliminary benchmarks of the board with a 10900K, just because. But first, as always, if you want to pick up any of the parts I'll be mentioning in this video, feel free to do it via my Amazon affiliate links in the description down below. It costs you nothing, but helps me make more videos like this. Or if you're in South Africa like me, you should be getting all of your gear at Wootwear, or you're doing it wrong. Now, to kick this whole thing off, let's get to know the board with a quick unboxing. Well, the box itself is a work of art all of its own. I especially like the shiny holographic effect ROG has going on here. It's kind of like that rare Charizard holographic card. And first up, inside the box is another smaller box, which houses the board's Wi-Fi antenna, and I'm pretty sure ROG went a bit different with this design. It's a little less gamery this time around, and I don't mind it. Just like I don't mind ROG including a nifty little GPU holder inside the box. Just underneath the board is where the rest of the goodies are hidden, and weirdly, the first of these is a circular cup holder thing, which is a nice to have, I guess. Then a nice little welcome card, the headliner of the show, some really decent quality stickers, the only ones of which I'd actually use being the cable labels and battery stickers, but still, kinda cool. Then we've got the manual telling you how not to break things, but I don't let books tell me how to live my life, so that goes straight back into the box. Back to the legitimately useful stuff, we've got a generous kit of cable ties, a replacement Q-latch thing for your M.2 drives, those things absolutely rock by the way, a cool little ROG keychain, a pack of four SATA cables, none of which were stolen by previous reviewers, shockingly. SATA cables are like lighters in the tech reviewer scene, so yeah. And lastly, a couple of screws and a kit for attaching the little included BRM fan, and two tiny little M.2 rubber pads. Not the most impressive unboxing experience I've ever had, but it's got everything you need and a little bit extra, so props where it's due, ROG. Now, aesthetically, the board is somewhat similar to the Z490 Strix I took a look at about seven months ago when it sliced open my hand. The Z590 Strix features about the same level of sharp edges and corners as the previous gen board, and the same black hole color scheme, all of which makes for an unapologetically in-your-face gamery design that I can kind of appreciate. But with the Z590 Strix, I can appreciate it even more, as ROG does seem to have cleaned things up a little bit this time around. The Strix Z590 has toned down the whole gamery look quite a bit by toning down the cyberpunk graffiti-like branding in the middle of the board, and especially on the chipset heating. That, along with more rounded corners here and there, the replacement of a lot of the reflective surfaces with a more matte finish, and the covering up of more of the PCB itself just makes the entire package look a heck of a lot cleaner, less busy, more streamlined, and in my opinion, the board definitely looking more like a snack because of it. The board's lighting has also been toned down a bit this generation, but thankfully in all the right ways. Instead of having two separate lighting zones like on the Z490, the Z590 tastefully combines the two on the IO shield into a reflective 3D-like RGB strip that I think looks a lot cleaner and a heck of a lot more badass. ROG also did away with the large RGB logo strapped to the chipset heatsink and replaced it with a more subtle design along with a tiny RGB logo right at the bottom for a more understated taste of RGB. And just to put any doubts to rest that this is, in fact, a Strix board, ROG decided to add some more RGB flair to the board right on top of the M.2 heatsink, and I think it looks kind of slick. Not too in your face, but definitely something that'll draw your attention to the PCIe 4.0 drive that I hope you'll be pairing this board with, if you do pair it with an 11th gen chip, that is. The board features what seems like a fairly overbuilt power delivery system, at least for 10th gen and even some 11th gen processors, with a more than capable 14 plus 2 power phase design. 
Along with that, it should excel in the memory department too, with the board being equipped with ROG's proprietary memory trace layouts, which they call OptumM3. It comes with a bunch of cool advantages, but the most important of which, to me at least, is that the board should support a max overclock memory speed of 5,333 MHz, which is just ludicrous. Storage is probably one of my favorite parts of this board for a bunch of reasons. Not only do we have support for a massive four M.2 drives, all of which include heat sinks, but we also get these small plastic clip things Asus has been rolling out recently. You know, those little clips that let you secure M.2 drives without having to mess around with screws. It's the best thing since Uber Eats. Not sponsored, but Uber, hit me up anytime. As for the heathens among you still rocking hard drives or SATA SSDs, you're not being left out in the cold at all, as the board does have a full suite of six SATA ports. The board also treats us to some impressive connectivity capabilities, including two, count them, two 2.5 gigabit ethernet ports, which is more than enough bandwidth for 99% of gamers. But if you prefer going the wireless route, you can jump onto that train as well with a speedy Wi-Fi 6 integration right into the board with like the antenna we checked out earlier. And on the topic of connecting things, you sure can connect a lot of things to this board. Like 10 USB things as a starter. That's right, on the I.O. front, we've got a massive 10 USB ports to choose from, including a mix of USB 2.0, 3.2, Gen 1 and 2, and even a full Type-C port, which, as someone who'd power their entire being with USB if I could, makes me a very happy boy. Completing the rear I.O., we also have a display port, HDMI port, your usual array of audio jacks, gold-plated audio jacks at that, an optical out along with the stupidly useful BIOS flashback and clear CMOS button, and I can't even describe how much time and effort those last two has saved me almost every day. I won't be going over all of the internal connectors on the board, so just check the description down below for all of those, but here are some of the headlines. One Thunderbolt 4 header, a total of 8 fan, pump, and VRM fan headers, 4 RGB headers, and one of the most overlooked selling points of any motherboard, a friggin' Q display for debugging. I don't know how displays like this aren't like requirements for all boards at this price yet, they're just so useful. Oh, um, that reminds me, I haven't even talked about how much this thing costs. Right now the board is selling for around $380 on Amazon and about 8,600 Rand here in South Africa, which definitely puts it at a bit of a higher price class than most mid-tier boards, but this is Strix we're talking about here and uh, you usually get what you pay for. And part of what you're paying for is metal, and a heck of a lot of it. I've already mentioned that each M.2 gets its own dedicated heatsink, but that's only part of the heat spreader puzzle. The board also boasts a thick boy chipset heatsink, as well as two huge VRM heatsinks that I have no doubt will keep the power delivery running nice and cool like. And if you do end up using a water cooler or want to overclock your chip to like 9 billion gigahertz and don't want to have to worry about your VRM temps, you can always just mount the included VRM fan onto the little bracket and then be on your way. And that mostly covers it. The last few things that deserve a quick mention is the board's beefy audio solution backed by impressive features and software, as well as an entire suite of Asus AI tools for like everything from overclocking, networking, noise cancellation, and like even cooling. Overall, the board seems remarkably solid as I'd expect from a Strix board, and there's very little to complain about without like having spent some actual time working with it. But from this initial impression, the only things I would like to see included would be a dedicated onboard power and reset switch, which ROG decided to like hold captive for only their highest tier boards. Just give us those buttons, please, Asus. Come on, come on, come on. Now, even though this is by no means a review video, I did end up playing around with the board and Intel's last gen Core i9 10900K for a bit, you know, since the 11th gen chips are totally not out or on sale yet, even though they totally are. So I might as well just share some of the data I got with all of you guys for funsies. Now, I only have numbers from the 10900K and AMD's 3800XC to show in these charts, since those are, you know, like the only CPUs I had to work with. So don't at me. Oh, and I ran stock tests with XMP enabled with my kit of Crucial Ballistics RGB running at 3600 MHz CL16. And in the case of the Z590, I left MCE on auto 
since that's what I suspect most of you will be using too. And first up, you know we gotta throw in some Cinebench, and unsurprisingly, the 10 core chip crushed it when it came to multi-threaded testing, because obviously it did. But it did underperform a little bit when it came to single-threaded workloads. Blender, with its reliance on multi-threaded muscle, ran like a dream on the Z590 and 10900K system. As for gaming, all tests were run at 1080p using high to max settings in all titles to single out CPU performance as much as possible. And the Z590 plus 10900K system flexed its muscles hard, beating out the 3800 XT in all of the games I tested, sometimes just barely and other times by a lot. Obviously this would be a different story if I had a 5000 series chip to like toss into the mix, or probably even Intel's totally under embargo 11th gen chips, but still, these numbers are nothing to scoff at. I just wish I had the time to overclock the 10900K on the board as I know I'm leaving a lot of performance on the table here, but hey, again, this isn't a review, which is why I also didn't record power or temperature results for this video. Now. I know I used a 10th gen chip with this board, and the numbers do look pretty promising, but I actually wouldn't recommend pairing a 10th gen chip with the Z590 board. Sure, they might work together just fine, and performance-wise, you really can't get a better chipset to pair with a 10th or 11th gen chip, but some of the key features of the Z590 are locked to anyone running a 10th gen chip. Most notably, the 11th gen chips finally unlock support for PCIe Gen 4. And as someone who very recently got into the PCIe Gen 4 M.2 game, that's a pretty big deal. For whatever performance increase comes along with the 11th Gen chips, support for Gen 4 is to me personally the biggest selling point. So missing out on that would kind of be a shame. Just like it would be a shame for me to keep this video going. Asus ROG Strix Z590 e Gaming Wi-Fi seems like yet another solid entry into the Strix family of boards, with a bunch of cool features, more ports and connectivity than even I can utilize, and a robust power delivery system that should handle pretty much any 10th or 11th gen chip you can throw at it. If you're thinking of picking up one of the 11th gen chips when they launch, in just like a day or two, stay tuned as I'll have a review out of one, along with an Asus Tough Gaming Z590, hashtag soon. Big thanks to ROG South Africa for letting me mess around with their board, and big thanks to everyone for making it this far into the video. Again. If you want to pick up any of the parts I mentioned in this video, consider doing it via my Amazon affiliate links in the description down below. Or if you're in South Africa, grab it all at Woodware and thank me later. So, I'll see you on the official Intel 11th Gen launch day. Cheers.